Okay. So again, welcome. And we start by offering a land acknowledgement to recognize the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. It involves reflection on the long-standing history of the land, which brings each of us to this space. We're not meeting in person, and we come from many different places, but it's still important to acknowledge that we in Chicago, which is where I'm from, occupy unceded land that is part of the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi nations, who were forcibly removed from this land in the 19th century. Other tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Miami, Sauk, and Fox also consider this region home. And other native peoples from diverse tribes, in part due to Chicago's role as a forced relocation destination, <clears throat> have called and continue to call Chicago home. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. I want to go over a few other points to make this as open and engaging a space as we can have for an important conversation about cultural work and revolution today. We also encourage folks to post links in the chat that will inform other participants of campaigns on which you are working, organizations you're part of or want us to know about, where people can find your artwork or reference materials you think will be helpful. That's another way we can further share your work and your wisdom. Okay, now we get into the nitty gritty the real deal here. The moderator for our first session is Andrew Romanelli. A slot machine raised in a supermarket, he's a product of pneumonia, short buses, and the many institutions that failed to make him respectable. He has peeled potatoes, bust tables, collected debts, hustled on wide boulevards, hawked shoes, cigarettes, delivered hair products, and provides customer service for inmates across the country. In addition to being an IWW member, he's a wonderful poet, and we'll take away the session now. Please take it away, Andrew. Thank you, Lou. Uh, welcome everyone um, to our first session titled, The Past is Never Dead. It's not even past. I'm gonna tell you about our uh, three opening panelists um, and a little bit about them, but I, yes, I definitely encourage you all to check out their full bios. Um, our first presenter is uh, Chris Mahan independent scholar and labor educator who has a special research interest in abolitionism and the Civil War, as well as U.S. labor history. And then we'll also be hearing from Ruben Guevara, a Los Angeles native, Chicano musician, singer, songwriter, poet, performance artist, activist, producer, short story author, and historian. Um, we'll also be hearing from Stephen Newcomb, he was a legal scholar and one of the world's foremost authorities on the doctrine of Christian discovery. Stephen uh, was unable to be here in person, but he allowed us to use a previously recorded uh, commentary, which we will show, and I will uh, talk a little bit more about when we get to that, that point. Um, so, Chris, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, it's a great honor to, to speak at a conference like this. I've been asked to talk about the history of the 19th century abolitionist movement against chattel slavery and reconstruction and um, perhaps, and the role particularly of, of culture in that and cultural struggle in that. And so I'd, I'd just like to make some brief comments about that, about uh, some of the lessons that can be learned, but, but also some questions that I think we all need to grapple with today about from that period. And very much in the spirit of, I wanna just throw out some, some suggestions and, and then hear what, what other people have to say. I think the thing we have to understand about the 19th century abolitionist movement 
was that it came at its no great movement. And this was a, just a historic movement. No great movement comes about in a void. I mean, if we're gonna understand the first abolitionist movement, I think we have to understand the, the, the economic and social conditions that created it. Slavery had existed for almost 200 years before the abolitionist movement of the, of the early 1800s began, but something in the late 1700s, early 1800s, there were some very, very dramatic events that took place and particularly the introduction of a new technology, which was steam power. So finally human beings were able to, to use more than just manual labor. And this created the, the uh, steam engine, the, which led to the, the, the uh, power loom, the steam locomotive, the steamboat, but it also did two things, which I think we forget when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. First of all, it created the steam powered printing press, which made it possible to produce books and newspapers much more quickly. And the other thing is that in the South, the invention of the cotton gin and then the application of steam power to the cotton gin took slavery and vastly, vastly increased the, the, the horror of slavery by trading a world textile industry in Northern England and, and the Northern United States. These were the places of the, the dark satanic mills that William Blake talked about. And then a situation in the South where the slave was picking cotton that was shipped millions and millions of pounds of this were, were shipped to New England and England. And so you have a gigantic expansion in the early 1800s, the first half of the 19th century of the industrial system in the North and the, and the slave system in the South. And what happens for 30 years before the Civil War, there's a cultural civil war and there's a cultural phenomenon called the abolitionists and they produce novels, they produce public speakers, they produce poets, they, they produce performance artists. I mean, there were artists, there were abolitionists who would go into churches at that time and it was kind of like act up in the 1980s, drawing the attention to, to AIDS. They would disrupt church services and demand that the churches take a position against slavery. You had the greatest novel of the, of the 19th century, Uncle Tom's Cabin produced. You had the most eloquent public speakers, Frederick Douglass and, and Wendell Phillips, who at a certain time were in every anthology of public speaking. You had the, the poet, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, who nowadays, you know, is, if he's in anthologies, he's stuck at the end with one of his minor poems about snow in New England, but in fact was a fierce abolitionist who denounced Daniel Webster for being a traitor to the, to the North. Um, so you have this very, very vibrant movement in which the, the, the culture plays this very, very important role. But I think the thing we have to understand about that movement is that it was able to do only certain things because the society, what, what the abolitionists of that time were able to do is they were able to raise public consciousness about a specific form of private property, what they called property in man, that is actual chattel slavery. But they weren't at that time before the Civil War able to, to mobilize the society against all private property. And you also had a situation where these, these industrial capitalists in the North who were very, very much opposed to property. They were opposed to property and man because they wanted people to be free so that they could exploit them. And you have a situation where ultimately you have a civil war, you have a fight over what's the society gonna be after the civil war. The very best of the abolitionists take the position that the fight to free enslaved labor was the first blow in the fight to, to end all exploitation. But another section of the abolitionist movement decides that, that the struggle's over once slavery has been abolished. So you have a, a, 
a, a gigantic debate there. I think the, the abolitionists at their very best, they not only displayed, there's a tendency I think in, 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 in recounting the history to focus a lot on the physical courage of the abolitionists, their, their willingness to endure possible death, mobbing, uh, being chased. But I think sometimes we forget their tremendous moral courage and their willingness to speak truth to power. And we forget how much slavery at that time was considered to be just part of human nature, something that, that was inevitable, that was gonna go on forever. And their willingness to, to, to challenge that is, is something that we should learn from. Um, to me, the, the, the place where this is shown most vividly is in the way the very best of the abolitionists reacted to the, to the UN cry that unfolded in the country after John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. I mean, once that raid took place and people, 22 men tried to seize the biggest federal arsenal in the United States and distribute the, the weapons to slaves, there was a gigantic UN cry uh, and, and a demand on the part of the authorities that everybody associated with, with the abolitionists explain themselves and they have to apologize and they have to be investigated. And the very, very best of the abolitionists, I, I think the, the, the most telling example is what the, the great uh, public speaker, Wendell Phillips, they were having none of, of, of apologies. Wendell Phillips got up at a church in Brooklyn, the leading abolitionist church in Brooklyn, New York. And he says, they have accused John Brown of engaging in insurrection. You can't engage in insurrection in, in Virginia. Virginia does not have a government. A place that, that sells children on auction blocks, there's no government there. The Commonwealth of Virginia is a pirate ship. And John Brown is a Lord High Admiral of the Seas with a commission from God to sink the pirate ship of slavery. Thoreau gets up and defends John Brown and says they took his sharp rifle, Sharp's rifle away from him, but they left him his capacity of speech, his Sharp's rifle of infinitely sure and longer range. So I think the question for us in, in looking at this abolitionist movement, which was only, a, it was able to mobilize public sentiment against one form of prop, private property. How do we learn from that today? How do, we, how do we take the new technology of today that's vastly superior to the steam power printing press and utilize that, that, that technology to, to spread new ideas? How do we mobilize people not just against property and man, but all exploitative private property? And what's the equivalent for today of, of the sentence, the Commonwealth of Virginia is a pirate ship? So I think if we can discuss these things today, I'd like to hear what other people have to say, and I hope we can grapple with these issues today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to remind everybody to be sure you're muted so we can hear everyone clearly. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, St Stephen Newcomb uh, couldn't be here. Um, he had to unfortunately uh, withdraw, but uh, he, he graciously consented to let us use a recording of his address to World Parliament of Religions today. And we definitely want to acknowledge that we were introduced to Stephen by the incomparable musician and activist Buff Buffy St. Clair, and we thank her for that introduction. Buffy St. Marie. My apologies. Yes. Kishi le miang, mil ongunda wakan, mili ongunda wakan, wuli Nepali, wuli Nepalinen, wanishi kishi le miang. Water is life. Good morning. I want to begin by paying my respects to the original nations on whose territory this building now stands. I want to ex acknowledge the ancestors who have loved the land 
through ceremonial conduct and prayers. And I want to acknowledge the original free and independent existence of our nations and peoples extending back to the beginning of time through our oral histories and our oral traditions. Yesterday, I listened with, with interest to the plenary session on climate change. It occurred to me that working on climate change without working on paradigm change would be a grave mistake. We need a mental and behavioral shift away from the prevailing paradigm of domination and dehumanization, the symptoms of which are everywhere on planet Earth, our mother. More than five centuries ago, various popes in Rome, on behalf of Christendom, unleashed the paradigm I'm talking about. It might, may surprise you to learn that the empire domination model of Christianity was woven by jurists into the laws and policies of the United States and into the laws and policies of other countries such as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. That hidden code of Christian empire has worked for more than five centuries toward the dissolution of our original nations and peoples here on Great Turtle Island and Abi Ayala to the south. The idea patterns of domination and so-called Christian discovery have been incorporated into U.S. federal Indian law where they remain to this day. Those ideas are traced to Vatican documents of the 15th century and to royal charters of England, which declared the right of Christian people to discover the lands of heathens and infidels and to assume a right of domination or subjugation against the nations and peoples of those places. In 1823, Chief Justice John Marshall, on behalf of the United States Supreme Court, wrote that doctrine into U.S. case law, where it remains to this day. We can trace the pattern back to 1452 and the bull Doom Diversus, issued by Pope Nicholas V to King Alfonso of Portugal. It instructed the king to go to the western coast of Africa and to non-Christian lands everywhere, and to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. That was repeated in 1493, shortly after Cristobal Colon sailed across the ocean to what is now called the Caribbean and claimed possession of our original lands on behalf of the Spanish crown. Our documentary movie, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code, based on my book, Pagans in the Promised Land, reveals and focuses on this pattern that I'm talking about today. It is a focus we began more than 20 years ago. In 1992, my friend and colleague, my mentor, Virgil Kilstraight, a traditional headman and spiritual leader of the Oglala Lakota Nation, one of the spiritual leaders, he and I founded the Indigenous Law Institute and began our campaign against this pattern. In 1993, we attended the Parliament of the World's Religions, and Virgil spoke on the seven laws of the Ochete Shikowan, the sacred laws, compassion and respect, to share and to care and to give, bravery and courage, patience and fortitude, humility and humbleness, seeking wisdom and seeking understanding. And we also began to reveal to the world the pattern of which I'm speaking about today. That was during the time of Pope John Paul II. We called on him to formally revoke the Inter Cetera Papal Bull of 1493 and our campaign against the paradigm of domination and dehumanization continues today under the papacy of, uh, or at the time of the papacy of Pope Francis. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had more time to go into detail. Given my time constraint, I will leave you with this. In 1954, the U.S. Justice Department delivered a legal brief to the U.S. Supreme Court in the case Tihitan Indians versus the United States. And the main argument of the Justice Department was that the Tihitan people of, in Alaska did not deserve monetary compensation for a taking of their timber because, quote, the Christian nations of Europe had discovered the lands of heathens and infidels. And the U.S. Supreme Court in 1955 upheld that the same year I was born and cited to Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law, which referenced all the things I'm talking about. And among the other things that Wheaton said was this, the heathen nations of the other quarters of the globe were the lawful spoil and prey of their civilized conquerors. This was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court as recently as 2005 in the case City of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York. I want to conclude by saying that it is time for Christians and the churches that are doing so to stop lying about our ceremonies. They need to stop telling our young people and others that our ceremonies are satanic or the work of the devil. This is killing many of our young people who, deprived of their cultural and spiritual identity in the wake of the domination of the residential and boarding schools, are ending their lives prematurely. Additionally, the governments and the churches need to start putting as much time, effort, and energy into assisting with the revitalization of our languages, cultures, and spiritual traditions and our sacred places as they put into attempting to, des to destroy them to begin with. Our original nations don't need reconciliation, we need decolonization. We and the planet need healing from the trauma brought on by chronic and ongoing domination. Thank you to all the Christians and Christian churches who have supported us in our efforts. We express our deep appreciation. We invite you to join us on the sacred path in honor of the first principle of original nations. Respect the earth as our mother and have a sacred regard for all living things. End the domination, all our relations, Wanishi. We are certainly grateful to have that video from Stephen Newcomb. And um, I want to thank him uh, and acknowledge Buffy St. Marie for introducing us to him. Um, our next presenter is Ruben Guevara. Ruben, are you ready? Ruben, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, I just woke up, so I'm not quite awake, but uh, yeah. So uh, you want to hear the poem now? Is that what's happening? Uh, no, brother, you're, you're speaking about your thoughts on this uh, theme, uh, right? Am I right or wrong? I thought I was going to uh, read a poem. Your poem uh, is in in the performance section. This is uh, it, this is the you were to, going to make a presentation on the theme of the conference in this part. Oh, oh, oh I see. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think uh, for as far as strategies and uh, why I do what I do. Well, first of all, why I do what I do. I think it's important for artists, activists. To, um, to continue their work of writing messages to the oppressor and to inspire, to inspire us and, our, and the workers that are in this struggle. Uh, that's, my, that's my calling, uh, that's what I do. I'm a poet, I'm a musician. Most of my material is, talks about the Chicano experience from the invasion to the present day. 
And uh, as far as new strategies, you know, I, <laughs> this might be out a little bit crazy, but uh, I think maybe we should look into uh, artificial intelligence to help us strategize better. So that's basically all I have to say. Thank we're you. Gonna um, we're going to open up to uh, questions. I want to remind everyone to uh, use the raise hand feature uh, in the reactions. You can also uh, post uh, questions in the chat. Hey, Zhu, you're up. All right. Sorry, I have a big mouth, comrades, but damn, that was deeply profound. And as somebody who just uh, sent a sci-fi novel to her editor two weeks ago, ah, it's going well. This concept of having AI strategize with us is fundamentally different from what we see in popular culture. And I, I'm deeply inspired just by that statement. I was wondering if you could elaborate, if you've envisioned, thought about what might that look like for us? Are you asking me that? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, you know, last night in the middle of the night, I, it came to my it came to my attention. Uh, what about AI? You know, uh, for strategies, and uh, I really haven't formulated anything more beyond that. What that might look like, but uh, I've been very interested in that. Uh, I'm also a short story writer. I just finished writing a story that that involves AI, uh, uh, android spirits. I call them. Uh, I don't know. It's just an idea that popped into my head last night, and I don't think I don't have any more to to contribute to it. So, but uh, no, I'm telling you, man, you just sparked a fucking nuclear part. I'm sorry, I stopped cussing. You sparked a nuclear bomb in my head. I I think we got to talk more about this topic at some point because I think it's brilliant, and I don't think it's been explored enough. I don't think anyway. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you, thank you. Do we have any more questions or thoughts? Um, I saw Yolanda raising their hand. And uh, just a reminder, folks can use the reactions. And we might see you faster. But we'll also look out for people raising their hands in their webcams. So sorry, Yolanda. We really cannot understand a word. Somebody please just answer the question. Thank you. <clears throat> well, okay. I think I can maybe try to answer. <clears throat> uh, artificial intelligence is the replication of human intelligence processes by machines. AI uses vast amounts of data and statistics to identify patterns, the likelihood of future events, and to automate tasks typically done by humans. So that's the definition that I have here. If anybody else wants to add, go right ahead, please. Uh, besides that, I think the dream is, may I, I'm sorry, I'm not on the panel, can I help? Is that cool or no? Yeah. Um, the artificial intelligence is also seen as a, I think in popular culture as either a threat to the existence of humanity, which is BS, that's not a definition, but I think conceptually people think the Terminator or whatnot, but also um, the potential for abundance. Artificial intelligence, if done correctly, could solve a lot of problems and not just take care of labor. Um, we're talking and taking care of like medical situations and AI has a better capacity to be able to see what, what medication will hurt a person as opposed to a doctor, right? Not that the doctor's skills are invalued, but you know it takes on a whole different different um, way of thinking about how to problem solve and a whole different capacity in terms of what's possible in terms of data storage. You know, so it's a lot. AI is a lot, um, uh, and and uh, we we we're not seeing true AI, but like little little things like uh, well anyway I won't get into it, but it's it's it it could be this could be it, man. If we reach AI and use it in the hands of the people, this could be a utopia. I think. Sarah, what's your question? Well, I had a comment. I didn't have a question. Okay. Um, well, I was a little, I was off for a minute because my internet went out. But um, I have been reading with interest articles about AI. Um, you know, 
especially in the arts, because it's displacing illustrators. It can, it can, you know, um, study poetry and then write a poem or make a painting, so-called, you know, a visual. Um, and under private property system, which is, you know, you got to work, you got to work to make money to live and rent. You can't rent anymore anyway, but but it's displacing now cultural workers. It's displacing artists. It's it's writing articles. It's displacing journalists. So it's a problem in under capitalism or any private property system. Um, and as as Jesus says, it's a, it's could liberate us in ways. I mean, I I don't think it should displace poets. Human beings need to do culture. We we don't need machines for that. We we have the human heart, you know. So that's another issue. But as far as you know, doing doing intellectual work, helping helping process data that's a wonderful thing um but it, it none of none of the um automation is wonderful in the sense that it's displacing workers and you know and now we have homeless people in the street who are mathematicians or whatever i know some of them so yeah so it's really a question it's really a systemic question it's like what kind of a society are we going to have where where it's a positive force and not and not pushing people out onto the street and cultural workers, you know, included. So that's all. Yeah, I'll add real quickly. There's a, a futuristic video game called Cyberpunk and they have radio stations and they announce Pulitzer Prize winners uh, or or AI winning Pulitzer Prize. Um, Okay, Lou, our, our next question. Yeah, also a comment um, on this. I, I think I want to go back also to, to the beginning of, of the presentations and, and see how this relates, because it really does. Um, and and kind of a little bit off of what Sarah said. Sarah was talking about how... Um, uh, AI is throwing people out of work, or and it is. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, but that was true in the 19th century with with industry. Um, we're we're recapitulating on a higher level what happened in the mid 1800s with the rise of steam power, industrialism, and so forth. And there were people who, you know, attacked the machines in in those days, um, as if the machines themselves were the enemy. Well, AI isn't the enemy any more than the machines were then, but they, in the hands of the class that holds power, they are, of course, they they present a um, an, an antithetical uh, character to the to the to the working class. So, what are we looking at today? Is I think something that. Uh, that I think, uh, okay, let's go back to this question of abolitionism in the in the in the in the 19th century, abolition put the hands uh, put the put the hands of power in uh, or put power in the hands of the uh, industrial and financial capitalists of of the North. That was what the the ultimate result was with again the uh, people who had been slaves now reduced to some some of some form of peonage and in fact even then you know partial slavery well today the difference is that we're looking at an opportunity to i think chris referred to it to um eliminate private property period that is the exploitation of of man by by another ruling class, and I think that's I think Ruben is right in in pointing us toward the question of some form of 
of getting hold of this question of, of artificial intelligence and all of the manifestations of, of um, private uh, <clears throat> private property. Um, last, I just I want to say that um, that there is so just as industrial society, the beginning of industrial society, set a whole new opportunity forward for creativity and culture, as well as other aspects of society, the, uh, the, uh, the beginnings of artificial intelligence are doing the same thing for creativity. It doesn't mean necessarily uh, replacement, but it does mean taking a lot of a lot of the aspects of creativity and and boosting it in a way that we can't even imagine right now. I mean, a lot of people who are working in 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 graphics, you know, see this much more clearly than I do, uh, and I know that that that's true in music as well. So let's, you know, I, I don't think it's something we need to sit on the, you know, and condemn the the tool as much as figure out how how power is wielded and what our role as cultural workers are in developing the power necessarily to control those tools. I'm done. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Nassim, your question or comment. Hi, thank you for this great discussion. I think having heard the three speakers puts it in perspective about a, a historical perspective on AI as well. I completely agree with what's already been said, which is, you know, AI is a tool. As a scientist, I use AI, but you know, in it was mentioned already that AI in a steam engine and, and um, cotton gins actually was used as a tool to further oppress people, whereas a steam press enabled abolitionists to use that technology. So my question and my inspiration, I think, is coming from that notion of using AI in ways that can enable the, this resurgence of abolitionist movement to um, further our message. And I think that is possible uh, when we look at other tools that are in our um, in our hands, like social media connections. It actually makes it even more important for us to use any technology to um, expand this movement and to recruit more people and to enlighten and and um, connect with more people who. Um, who will agree on um, on building this movement again? Um, I'm disillusioned that you know even our paths of communication are being so overrun with capitalist interest that that it is um, you know stifling a lot of the movement building that we should be doing. And um, I'm Nassim Nouri. I uh, live in Mwek Maloney lands in today's San Jose, and uh, I'm with the Green Party of Santa Clara County in California. Thank you, Nassim. Hey, Zoo, you have a comment or question? I do, but I'll do progressive stack because I've talked a lot. If anybody else wants to go first. All right, big mouth, here we go. Um, so I, I just want to make something clear that yes, we've seen new technology before, but this is qualitatively different when we're saying, seeing here that this technology is not only permanently replacing workers, it's not meeting the needs of the population growth and it's not creating new jobs, right? Um, and I don't want to blame the tools. This is just what's happening. Uh, but I had this question is for Chris and, and maybe it's a little too, I don't know, mundane, but can you offer examples of the kinds of cultural work that people did, poetry, songs, newspaper, graphics that helped the abolitionists put forth this new way of thinking about why do we have to dismantle slavery? Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, about that second video, that was so deeply inspiring and moving. I'm a devout Roman Catholic. I don't I don't like the bureaucracy and shit, but I'm a devout Roman Catholic. And and the statement about to help with reconciliation, let's let's decolonize. I I or what was it? Some something like that. But this whole idea that, you know, yes, we have to decolonize. Yes, the the the, the people need to be made whole. And and the approaches are not just a Catholic church, but other religious institutions take 
it's just unconscionable. And and we really, you know, that to me, it's unconscionable and criminal. But anyway, Chris, I hope my question made sense. I posted it in here. I can repost it. See if uh, you can answer that for me, brother. Okay. Would you like me to address that now? Yeah, sure, man. Okay. So on, on forms of the abolitionists, the principal one was the, the newspapers. I mean, the, the most famous abolitionist newspapers, The Liberator, which was published weekly in Boston for over 30 years, began January 1831. Its editor was physically attacked uh, in 1835, dragged through the streets of Boston with a rope around his neck, but he kept publishing. Um, Elijah Lovejoy was a, a, another uh, editor, uh, anti-slavery editor. We're actually meeting six days after the anniversary of the murder of Elijah Lovejoy, which took place on November 7th, uh, 1837. And ever since has been commemorated as a, I mean, he was killed while trying to defend his print, printing press from a mob. So you had newspapers. The other thing that you had was public speakers. I mean, this was a period of time when public speaking was a very, very big deal. I mean, it was like, like musical performances or, you know, people, large halls, large meeting halls would, would be filled with hundreds of people who would hear debates. And the abolitionists got out there and they participated in all the debates. They went to the small towns. You had people like, of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with Frederick Douglass and his famous speeches, what to a slave is, your, is the 4th of July. A Wendell Phillips, who I mentioned, also was known as the trumpet of liberty because of his extraordinary eloquence. And I would just recommend to anyone, if you wanna know more about the abolitionists, Google Wendell Phillips and read his oration in defense of Toussaint Louverture, read his, his other uh, major speeches. Uh, he was an extraordinary figure, but they had a whole network of hundreds of dozens and dozens of, of speakers. One of them, Theodore Dwight Weld, lost his voice uh, from, because there were no microphones back in those days, right? So he just totally lost his voice. So then he became an editor and a researcher and he wrote this, this encyclopedic work, the Anti-Slavery Handbook, which contained all these memoirs. I mean, this is a period of time when the African-American memoir really is, is developed, you know, and memoir as a, as, a, as a literary genre, because people who flee from slavery then write up their experiences. And that has an extraordinary effect on, on a large part of the, the Northern population. Um, you have, as I said, in addition to that, the abolitionists who used to do things like, they had to do a lot of fundraising. So they would have what they called abolition fairs and they would sell arts and crafts, you know, and they would inscribe uh, cups and plates and, and different things with, with anti-slavery slogans or depictions of slaves running away or of the cruelty of, of slavery. My favorite of these is in the Chicago Historical Society Museum. There's a, there's a, a, a pot holder, you know, for, like for the kitchen and inscribed with the words, any holder except a slaveholder. So, um, you know, you, they basically used every genre. I mean, there were there was a major musical group that that um, was an abolition that would perform at the at the public events. Um, again, the the novel. Well, I mean, if we're really going to talk about abolitionism, there were a number of different anti-slavery novels. The most famous of which, of course, is Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the first novel in American history where uh, an African-American man is the hero. And Uncle Tom isn't an Uncle Tom in the sense that we know that term now. Uh, he's actually a heroic figure. And that book was just a literary sensation where it, it, the steam powered printing press that I referred to, the steam powered printing presses ran day and night, both when the when, to produce the newspaper that the, that that uh, novel was originally serialized in, and then to produce it when, when uh, it was actually published as a book, that they, they had eight steam-powered printing presses running day and night. It was, it was the bestseller of its time in both the United States and in England, and it played a major role. And Charles Sumner, who was one of the major uh, anti-slavery uh, anti figures in the US Senate, stated emphatically that without Uncle Tom's Cabin, 
Abraham Lincoln would never have been elected president of the United States. And it had also played a major role in creating sympathy for the slave in Britain, which played, in turn played a major role in blocking uh, Britain from intervening on the side of the Confederacy in the U.S. Civil War, which would have been a real, was at a certain point, a real danger. So basically, you have all different uh, forms of, they basically tried to use every form of communication that existed at that time. I mean, I think the challenge for us is in honoring them and standing on their work, we also have additional means of communication, which we should try, of course, to use as creatively as they use theirs. Thank you, Chris. Adam, I believe we have a, you have a question from Yolanda. Yes, that's what I'm raising my hand for exactly. Um, and uh, I'll also just say that we have a lot of chat about um, Twitter and Elon Musk in uh, the chat. And I, I personally love how the conversation branches off in many directions and just, yeah, also want to um, uh, remind us that the, the focus on this section is applying these lessons from history to our current situation. We have a very specific question on artificial intelligence, which is one of the topics that's come up here from Yolanda, whose audio isn't working, unfortunately. And she asked, um, sorry, <laughs> just pull it up here. Um, uh, well, she said she read a, a book by Jim someone, <laughs> possibly a league member. She can't remember his last name that said that DNA is used for computers. So her question is, is DNA part of artificial intelligence? And asks if we can read it out loud, which I just did. Um, and if anyone here knows the answer to this and can say and can speak to that. So I can just say I get a lot of AI. Okay, I'm a big nerd. You probably tell. And if you can't, you know now. I've not heard that argument, but I don't know, you know. Okay, thank you. Nassim says no. Thank you, sister, or other. Sarah, do you have a question or comment? Um, I'm just thinking possibly um in the, on the dna question that certainly computers and i guess artificial intelligence i don't know that much about it but certainly um is used you know to decode the geome um to you know they can do they can tracing the you know through your DNA, tracing your ancestry. And I'm, I'm quite sure that that that's, you know, a lot of that is done by computers and, and I don't know, AI, but, but that may be what, what you read. I, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how they would put DNA in a, you know, in a machine, but I would guess that that's that may be what what the person was writing about. Um, it certainly is this this being able to scrape a little something off a off a fossil or a little scrap of something and and figure out how this thing looked or or where it came from. I don't I don't know about it, but I think I think that that um, you know. Uh, certainly, artificial intelligence is is making those things possible for us to know, and it's probably amazing. I mean, it is amazing. That's all. Thank you, Sarah. Lou, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I think probably the, the simplest way. I mean, artificial intelligence is merely simply saying that machines that think, that's all it is. Uh, so, for example, uh, since we were talking about creativity, 
a lot of the newspaper are, if, if anybody here still reads newspapers, I think Chris might be the only one here who reads newspapers. But if anybody reads newspapers here, to, uh, you've probably read stories that have been written by uh, computers. I mean, that, this is very frequent in newspapers today. Sports stories are frequently written by by uh, by computers. That's an that's an application of artificial intelligence. If you want to look at something a little even simpler than that, um, how many of you are annoyed by predictive spelling on your on your on your phones? That's an application of artificial intelligence. That is uh, the computer in your phone analyzes the various keystrokes that you have made in, in the past, and it predicts what you're going to uh, type in your phone next. So it'll throw up a word that frequently, and it learns the words that, you're, that you use frequently. Um, <clears throat> uh, the phone under my phone knows the word Diana very very well because I type Diana in very frequently since that's my wife's name, and so all I do is put a D in and Diana pops up. So that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, that's very simple forms of what might be called artificial intelligence. So it's really nowhere nearly as as I mean, what what really is artificial intelligence is much more complex than that. I'm done. Thank you, Lou. Do we have any more questions or comments? We still have some time. Yeah, I have some to say. Yeah, you know, uh, <clears throat> let's not forget that computers are programmed by humans. <laughs> artificial intelligence, you know, is programmed by human beings. It, it doesn't program itself. Maybe the algorithms in a way do, but we're still ultimately in charge. And we can't forget that. Thank you, Ruben. Do we have any more questions or comments? Adam. Yeah, I have a half-baked thought to share. Um, I'll also elevate this from the chat that Yolanda remember the um, title of the book, and it was called Cutting Edge Capitalism. Um, so I think this question of artificial intelligence is really connected to this question of culture wars, um, because, um, I mean, we in the League talk so much about how um, automation digital technology and artificial intelligence have the potential to create a economic paradise for human beings and all life on earth. We talk about it and research it so much that to me at this point, it seems obvious, but to most people, it's not obvious. And this idea seems a little crazy still. And yet, we talk a lot in the League about the strategic importance for revolutionaries of emphasizing this very point. Um, there are a lot of legitimate reasons to be scared of this technology, but it is so, so crucial to understand that what we're really scared of is not the technology itself, but what will happen if we cross this threshold where eventually the machines will start designing themselves. Right now, human beings design them, but super general artificial intelligence is the threshold that is almost inevitable. Uh, at some point, we will cross it and machines actually design themselves. And what happens at that point, we can't predict. But we know that it is emerging out of what we are creating right now. Who has the power, as we have said, um, what our goals are will shape what the machine's goals are. And 
um, it, it will uh, emerge out of and therefore to some extent reflect the reality that we already have. So the point that I want to make is we got to get our fucking shit together. Sorry for the F word. <laughs> but we have to get our act together um, and, and uh, get this revolution on and hurry up right away with it um, so that uh, <laughs> our goals as a collective, as a society, change from, you know, just competing and hoarding resources and wealth uh, in, you know, concentrating it amongst just a few people to actually sharing the abundance that is possible according to need with everyone. If we can do that, then <laughs> we'll be in a much better position to cross this threshold. Um, and even the tech uh, people who understand this stuff way better than I do don't seem to get that. They still have this vision of going out and colonizing space. That's what Elon Musk's rockets are about. That's his vision. It's very dark when you think about it. We got to learn from indigenous wisdom. We got to get right with the earth. We got to start seeing ourselves as part of a delicate balance and we got to have a revolution that uh, institutionalizes these values in our social structures. Then imagine what this technology might do. Thanks, Adam. Nicholas, do you have a question or comment? I had a comment. Is it all right to go? Yes, please. Okay, excellent. My sound was acting up at the beginning, so sorry if I repeat something that's already been said or say something redundant, but I've been listening to the conversation the last couple of minutes, and one thing I want to kind of echo what Adam just said is that uh, a quote comes to mind, and it was by Kwame Nkrumah, and he, he said that the state is an expression of the domination of one class over another, and I think the, the nature of technology or the nature of anything that it is to develop is going to be deeply deeply influenced by those in power. So I, I think the question needs to be backwards. Like, you know, if we can't seize power, the technology is going to be used for capitalist interest. That's just going to be the nature of it. And then my next thought is I'm always working to try to make things as relevant as possible to the masses because, you know, a lot of my organizing is with the uh, directly impacted folks, formerly incarcerated, unhoused, because that that's where I think that where the revolution lies. So like, how is this relevant to them and their immediate needs, but also as a long-term strategy. If we can't make that relevant to folks, then it's already dead before it begins. But furthermore, really, I think the first initial question really is like, how are we going to seize power? Because if we don't seize power, those who, who control the lever of the power and, and the government uh, uh, through their uh, amassing of resources are going to determine how the technology is used. Like, you know, brother, brother Adam just said, like, you know, they want to go to the moon with it, right? We could be using technology for other reasons, but because we don't control any levers of states or any institutions, we can't really determine what that, that technology uh, looks like. So I think ideas don't fall out the sky. They're shaped by the social context. So we got to change the social context and culture wars are a part of that deeply because if we can't really show people a, a vision and not just a, of destruction, but a vision of abolition and really building and rebuilding, then it's going to be really difficult to people for people to get it online and envision what we're even talking about. Because like, you know, Adam said, like, it's not, you know, if it's not relevant and then they, they can't really envision, it's going to be difficult. So I think really the question is like, it always comes back to power for me, like Kwame, like Kwame and Kruma and Kwame Tari, they say, you know, we got to seize power. That's all I want, you know, and if we can't seize power, we can't transform these conditions. So those are just my thoughts. Thank you, Nicholas. Is, uh, I show I have a question or comment. Is it Risa? Risa? Yes, it's Risa. Thank you. Um, well, the latter part of Adam's comment and Nicholas's comment is, is where I was going um, with it. It's I'm not at all scared about AI, but it is about who has the power over it. And um, I live in Oakland. We have a police commission because we have a racist police department. Um, and the police chief gets on there and does a report every time and is all proud about how they use intelligence-based policing and that's gonna help address the situation. And then uh, there was a recent NOVA documentary that talked about um, AI and uh, policing and the problems in there. So yes, I'm a plus one to, we need to do the decolonization work now. Um, before there's more harm by AI. Thank you, Risa. And uh, Lou, you have a question or comment? Yes, I do. <clears throat> um, God, I tell you, listening to 
to Adam and to Nicholas and to Risa just <clears throat> just makes me excited to to continue this discussion. But I want to say um, that just in terms of first of all, this is the session is called uh, the past is <clears throat> isn't dead. It isn't even past. And so what that means to me in in this is. I think I said something like this before, but the uh, the struggles that took place in the 19th century are recapitulating themselves today and using some of the same forms so that uh, we have uh, uh, tremendous attacks by the ruling class using the elements of racism that have existed for centuries here. And this comes right out of the, the abolition struggle of the 1800s. It's an abolition struggle today on a much higher level. I want to say that, that, um, that the thing that Adam raised about the potential for abundance becomes really crucial today simply because the reins of power, as Nicholas was really elaborating on, but because the reins of power have threatened that possibility for abundance as never before. It was possible in the 19th century, and even when Marx wrote, he could see, as he did in his writings on the environment, he could see the, the, uh, <clears throat> the way in which capitalism at that point was destroying the environment. Well, just think of what it is today and how that threatens human life as well as other life on Earth. Um, this, is, this is an urgent time for cultural workers because if anyone has the capacity to reach the hearts and minds of people at this point, it's, it's people who are involved in cultural work. Uh, otherwise, if we don't do it, if we aren't part of that process, it, um, then our children and grandchildren, and in my case, great-grandchildren, won't even have the opportunity to survive until, uh, <clears throat> you know, for very much longer. Um, the question of, essentially what I'm saying is, it's up to our generations that is to say, the people who are allayed on this, this uh, gallery here, uh, it is up, up to our generations to make sure that abundance is even possible. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, we yeah, can yeah. do that, but it's up to us. I'm done. Thanks, Lou. Um, we're starting to come to the close of discussion. We have a couple more comments and questions. Sarah, go ahead. Uh, just briefly, I think we have to also face the fact that we live in a war economy. You know, a great percentage of our collective wealth is going into war killing, and that's been automated too. You know, we have, we have a, a poverty draft. But even soldiers are being, you know, displaced by drones. Just one person sitting at a computer figuring out, you know, who to drop a bomb on halfway around the world. And that's all to that's all that that's reflected in the streets where poor people are are shot down by the police, um, we're in a really brutal situation with a war economy, with people thrown out into the streets. And I think that that's, you know, at a time when this wonderful technology, in a sense, could be creating abundance without a lot of, you know, boring toil so so human beings could could be inventors and artists and take care of their children and i think 
that people are starting to question this, you know, this doesn't have to be. And the brutality of all the killing and, and invading that's going on and just one war after another. And absolutely, you know, Lou is right. What is the vision? And what is the what what is the Uncle Tom's cabin, you know, that gets written written to expose this and to rouse people? And I think, you know, it's not gonna be one book, but it's gonna be it's gonna be the visions of it doesn't have to be this way. And what is the alternative and how do we how do we get there? How do we organize ourselves? You know to not only spread this vision and across all these divisions that they set up, and I'm not going to go on and on, but I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Chris, would you like to close out our discussion portion? Well, I, I think Sarah really closed it out. I just have one additional comment about maybe to, to put the two strands of the discussion together together, it seems to me that people are worried about uh, artificial intelligence because they're worried that it will be a, a high-tech slave patrol. I mean, one of the things that, that the abolitionists, I mentioned the, the um, African-American memoir is something that came out of the abolitionist movement. There's a really good book by uh, Andrew Del Banco about the Underground Railroad and the role of fugitive slaves before the Civil War, it's called The War Before the War. And in there, he talks about how the abolitionists had to be very, very careful, particularly those who worked on the Underground Railroad, not only to protect people uh, who, from being captured, but there was an actual situation where slave owners would, would they would order slaves to go on the, on the Underground Railroad and, and were essentially like plants or, or um, double agents. And they collected intelligence. And the whole police structure of this country really comes out of the slave patrols and that history of, of not just only physical brutality, but the collection of intelligence. I mean, I think uh, the comment from Oakland was very instructive. That's what people I think are worried about. And the challenge for us is as, Sarah said so well, and others have said is how do we how do we give people a vision of a way in which we can go from the steam powered printing press being used to to put forward new ideas to all this new technology, including artificial intelligence, be used to put to to advocate not just for the abolition of property and man, but but exploitive private property generally. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to all, all the presenters and everyone who's asked questions and comments. Um, of course, we could still talk in the. We're going to move on now to our uh, performance section. And I'll uh, introduce the poet and read a little bit about the poet. Um, but I, of course, encourage you to look in the program um, for the for their full bio. So our first poet is uh, Gail Mitchell. Um, Gail Mitchell is a born and raised poet from San Francisco who says, words are my foundation and making a poem is part resistance, part fury. Emmett Till sits under my breastbone. Gail, are you ready for us? Is Gail here? Gail, are you muted? Not sure if I'm seeing her. I don't think she's on, brother. I just scrolled I don't up. see her name. I think she might have had a conflict. I reminded her yesterday. She's not on. Oh, dear. OK. James, she's a wonderful poet. So we'll go on to our, our next reader, uh, Jenny Lim is a recipient of the Penn Oakland Reginald Lockett and Berkeley Poetry Festival Lifetime Achievement Awards 
and she was San Francisco's Jazz Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2018. Jenny, are, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you. I've been listening to the conversation and it's been so stimulating, but rather than commenting or asking questions, I'll kind of respond through my poetry. I'm really honored to be part of this uh, conference, so thank you for inviting me. The infinite. The infinite is the source of joy. There is no joy in the finite. Only in the infinite is there joy. Upanishads. The explosion of a bomb silences everything else. The voice of a little child crouched in the stairwell with a stuffed teddy bear. The drop of a coin on the crossroads of mortality. The Saturday night special is a thundering train. A giant sprung from the catacombs of death. We are what we think and do. The poem is the breath that floats on the currents of broken memories, lives, and dismembered dreams in ashes. Do you think the mother of the one who pulls the trigger, releases the switch, doesn't know the whole story? You know, rats will eat themselves when it comes down to it. And so will men even if they do not admit it. All our lives, we find ourselves at odds with our reality. We ask ourselves, what is the meaning of life? Yet we never ask, what is the meaning of death? Is the martyr's self-sacrifice our redemption? The hand that pulls our hand from the grave? Men in the sun are heroes. We love what we cannot be. Does the river ever run uphill? What is life? How can we fill it when we kill it? How can we conquer the land if we cannot seize the sky? Who does Ukraine belong to? To the little girl crouched under the footprint of a bomb? To the tomb of the unknown soldier? Or to the choir of hungry ghosts? Nobody is on time. Nobody ever, ever arrives on time because waiting is like watching a snake moped in the darkness. Nothing ever arrives because waiting is like sitting inside the freight locker of a truck packed like cattle in search of El Dorado, the golden dream. Coyotes sell in exchange for lives. Nobody ever arrives because time Time is never ending, cycle of beginnings and beginnings and endings and endings, followed by unfixed space high and wide in the packed suitcase of our dreams, where tiny breath gasps for air through a keyhole of light as death stares, watching and waiting to hand you your papers. When will we arrive? You cry as you squeeze a drop of saliva from your parched throat and churning stomach. If I were you, I would give myself up. Your lonely coffin is invisible from the eyes of the world plunged in another war, another race. The miracle of freedom murmurs in your heart in the river of blood that courses the Rio Grande to your homeland in that place where butterflies circle light and where children play on the eternal meadow of forget-me-nots and dragonflies, laughing in the way that only children can laugh. The North and the South are indistinguishable to the light and shadow. I and other are as interchangeable as the minutes of the day. And your final breath is refuge from your birth skin. It doesn't hide the imperfections of the world. We are naked under the sky, first and last. Nobody ever arrives on time when death calls. War. War is madness. You ask yourself what lies behind, what lies beyond the power of a bomb behind the artillery of words, be, beyond the firing squad of the liberator who hands you a map in exchange for your land. 
What is empire but the slaughterhouse of dreams in a kingdom of illusion that feeds the hungry ego? The president yells, rise, beating his chest in the custom of chief guerrilla, and everyone rises. He raises the flag of victory over the wounded and countless innocents as if their blood was the biblical parting of the Red Sea. War doesn't forgive, it repeats itself in the delusional formula of its stunted imagination to usurp history from nature, to conquer the law of cause and effect as if killing was heroic and fighting the end game for peace. War is death stowed in malignant bowels. It is mangled limbs, smoldering roofs, iron windows that only bullets and bombs penetrate. It is black clouds of meaningless destitute suffering in a demented fever for power from which history will lose with its blind possession of memory. And who leaves home? Who leaves behind all that one loves? Everything dear to one. Are immigrants made or are they born? Like migrating geese, we come to seek better lives, to escape war and poverty, to carve from the wind a vision of a new life, a new world where the promise of a future can fulfill the mirage of freedom and belonging. Who can say that the wind does not belong to the sky? Who can say that the land beneath our feet is not ours to keep? Who can say that the air we breathe is not our right to breathe? From time immemorial, people have journeyed to follow the seasons, to seek greener pastures like the sheep that graze on summer grasses. When there's war, we migrate. When there's no work, we migrate. When there is little to eat, we migrate. We who love homeland, we who love family and everything left behind are immigrants made or born. Who can say that the wind does not belong to the sky? Who can say that the land beneath our feet is not ours to keep? And who can say that the air we breathe is not our right to breathe? I'll end with um, this one, from here to Gaza. There was a flood of bullets. You could not see death coming at you. There was a lingering silence. You couldn't see the cracked tiles in your courtyard, nor the olive trees severed from their branches. All the doors were locked when the roof of darkness descended on you. Time was a thief, yet your memory held true. Little do we know the terror that struck your heart. Little did we know it was the same that trembles in ours. The distance from here to Gaza is an illusion. Little do we know the border between Gaza and Atlanta or the West Bank and Minneapolis do not exist. The degree of separation is but a stone's throw away and the bullet that penetrates your chest is the same lodged in the exiled hearts of the people who haunt the streets of the Tenderloin, the Mission, Chinatown, History. History is occupied territory, a mausoleum erected over the blood of the innocent. Truth is the key you've kept for over 70 years to sustain your blazing love, your unbearable losses and humiliations vanished in the unfathomable and fathomable sorrows of humanity till now when they spring roots in our fearlessness with the infallibility of sprouting leaves and with the resilience of the earth and the courage of our hearts, like a melody that floats on the chords of the wind and reaches to the source of our being. Love, joy, life. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, thank you. Thank you, Jenny.
Um, I, I do see that Gail has come in, but we'll have her uh, go after Tongo. So let me introduce uh, Tongo Eisen Martin. Is a San Francisco is San Francisco's eighth and current poet laureate. He's an educator, movement worker, and um, I just had the pleasure of finishing uh, his his book, Blood on the Fog, put out by City Lights. Uh, Tongo, are you ready? Much love, y'all. Um, apparently, too much of San Francisco was not there in the first place. This dream requires more condemned Africans, or put another way, state violence rises down. Or still life is just getting warmed up. Or army life is looking for a new church and ignored all other suggestions. Or folktale writers have not made up their minds as to who is gonna be their friends. This is the worst downtown yet. And I've borrowed a cigarette everywhere. I've taken many a walk to the back of a bus. They let on out the back of a storyteller's prison sentence. Then I'm out the back of slave scars, but this is my comeback face. I left my watch on the public bathroom sink and took the toilet with me. Threw it at the first bus I saw eating single mothers half alive. It flew through the bus line number and on out the front of the White House. Hopefully you find comfort downtown, but if not, we brought you enough cigarette filters to make a decent winter coat. A special species of handshake lets all know who's king and what's the lifespan of uniform cloth. This coffin needs to quit acting like those are birds singing. Rusty nails have no wings, have no voice other than that of a white world dying. Their book pages in the gas pump, catchy, isn't it? The way three nooses is the rule, or the way potato sack masks go so well with radio codes, or the way condemned Africans fought their way back to the ocean, only to find waves made in 1920s burnt up piano parts, European backdoor deals, and red flowers for widows who spent all day in the sun mumbling at San Francisco. Red flowers, but what's the color of a doctor visit? There are book titles in the streets. Book titles like Hero, You Make a Better Zero, or Hey, Fur Coat Lady, The President is Dead, or Pay Me Back in Children, or They Hung Up Their Bodies in Their Own Museums, and other book titles pulled from a drum solo. Run Here, Hero, Lied the Hiding Place. All the bullets in 10 precincts know where to go. There's no heaven nor any other good idea in the sky. Politics means the people did it and people do it. I understand that when in San Francisco and other places that was never really there. I, I bet this ocean thinks it's an ocean, but it's not. It's just Sixth and Mission Street. I don't know who's king king of thin things you know like america i'm proud to deserve to die i'm gonna eat my dinner extra slow tonight in this police state candy dispenser you all call the neighborhood no set of manners goes unpunished never mind a murderer's insomnia or the tea kettle preparing everyone for police sirens they will slide the wallpaper right into your cereal bowl flesh market both sides of the levee change the plans both sides of the non-violence on no earth just an earth character i'm a beggar and all of this day is too easy. I want to see all the phases of a wall, every age it goes through. It's humanity, it's environmental racism. We call this the ordeal blues. Now crawl to the piano seat and make a blanket for yourself. Paint scenes of a child dancing up to a court appearance and leaving an adult, but not for home. Atlantic Ocean charts mixed in with the parole papers. Mainstream funding, the ruling class is only pacifism. Ruling class printing judges, Fiat kangaroos, making judges hand over fists, rapture cop packs and opposition whites all above a thorny stem, cast plans picked out like vans for the murder show, Anglo saints addicting you to a power structure. You want me to raise a little slave, don't you? Bash his little brain in and send him to your civil rights. No pain, just a white pain or delicate bullets in a box next to a stack of mindless scriptures making bullets look relevant. I remember you. Everywhere you lay your head is the capital of the South. The posture you introduced to that fence, the fence you introduced to political theory, like if you shred my dream, son, I will attack you to gun smoke. The suburbs are finally offended. This will be a meditation too. A tour guide through your robbery, I also am. Cigarette saying, look what I did about your silence. Ransom water and box spring gold, this decade is only for accent grooming, I guess. Ransom water and box spring gold, the corner store must die. War game. I guess. All these tongues run this junk. The start of mass destruction begins and ends in restaurant bathrooms that some people use and other people clean. Are you telling me there's a rag in the sky waiting for you? Yes. We've written a scene. We set a stage. We should have fit in. Warehouse jobs are for communists, but now more corridor and hallway have walked into our lives. Now the whistling is less playful. The barbed wire overcrowded too. My dear, if it is not a city, it is a prison. If it has a prison, it is a prison, not a city. 
When a courtyard talks on behalf of a military issue, our walks take place outside of the body. Dear life to your left, a medieval painting to your right. None of this really makes an impression. Crop people living in thin air. You have five minutes to learn how to see through this breeze. When a mask goes sideways, barbed wire becomes the floor. Barbed wire becomes the roof. 40 feet into the sky becomes out of bounds. When a mask breaks in half, mind which way the eyes go. You know they killed the world for the sake of giving everyone the same backstory. We watching Gary, Indiana, fight itself into the sky. Old pennies for win. For that win feeling you get before the hood goes up and over your headache. Pennies that stick together, mocking all aspirations. Stuck together pennies was the first newspaper I ever read, along with the storefront dwelling army that always lets us down. Where the Holy Spirit favors the back room. Souls in the situation that offer a hundred ways to remain a loser. Souls watching the clock, hoping their eyes don't lie to sad people. What was we talking about again? The narrator asked the graveyard, a 10 minutes flat said the graveyard, the funeral only took 10 minutes. They never tell that to anyone again. You just gonna pin the nineties on me, all 30 years of them. And why should I know the difference between sleep and satire? The pyramid of corner stores fell on our heads. We died right away. That building wants to climb up and jump off another building. These are downtown decisions. Somewhere on this planet, it's August 7th and we running down the rest thinking one more needs to come with me. What? evaporated on earth so that we could be sent back down all right y'all fire oh my gosh fire that was beautiful <clears throat> thank you so much i'll uh, reintroduce uh gail mitchell uh gail mitchell is a born and raised poet from san francisco who says Words are my foundation, and making a poem is part resistance, part fury. Emmett Till sits under my breastbone. Gail, are you ready for us? I'm ready for you. What t what's the time? I'm doing around like five minutes. All right, thank you. Photographs and American history. This is not a scrapbook for children. They are not photos for polite company, but these photos also define America. The woman running down the road naked after a napalm attack in Vietnam. The lynching of three or four black people in the book called The Movement, where white people gather like they were going on a Sunday picnic. And one couple in particular stand out, a young white man staring at the camera with his hands resting on the shoulders of a young girl who's probably his girlfriend. And there's the photo of Emmett Till barely 14 in this open casket. His mother dared to let America see what they had done to her boy, who was beaten and had his eye gouged out and then was thrown into the Tallahatchie River with a cotton gin fan around his neck. America, you cannot sink your sins. I pity the fool that forgets you are a bloodthirsty nation. Wounded knee, me lie. Disappointment sows seeds of sorrow. Regret does nothing for me. We have witnessed your bloodlust, America. We have seen your children seemingly unchanged by the deaths of others. Children dying in forced detention. Mothers and fathers whose babies have been stolen. We have been broken down and remade, not in your image, America, but in our own. And these are the photos that help me see you as you are. And this poem is for Jack Hirschman. It was uh, an answer to a poem Neely Tchaikovsky wrote. Uh, an answer to, I think, I know what happened. Love was made. Blades of grass were woven into memories. Constitutions had no bearings on this beautiful soul. Bounties were spread. A cup of wine was poured. And we sung many tongues. I know what happened. We saw each other across the room and love was knitted into hearts and slips of paper with words too holy to utter called us to the circle. And we pulled out our hair and cried and held each other. There were no fallen for each of us leaned against the other. I know what happened. Each of us lived out loud, told the truth and loved boldly, reassured that this gift of an open heart was the wellspring that will heal all wounds and free us from what ails us. I know what happened. Whispers and tears were just leftover prayers. Sometimes grief is misunderstood 
as is the ravings of a madman, each calling out to their own personal God, transcribing all that they would ever know or become. Even their fingers, even their fingerprints dance, and mystery is just another critical blow to reality. I know what happened. Just as some, some, some rings will turn your finger green, others, if you rub them, will send you the most eloquent words, and you would gather them in a basket as you would a babe left on the water. Yes, Aaron means exalted or strong or mountain of strength. It also gathers us to hear the message. I know what happened. The medium is in this the medium is this village that poured from our hearts. It is the soles of our feet ever making the sacred pilgrimage, reminding us that a thin thread ties us all together, and we are humbled to have known such beauty, to witness the unmaking and become the poem. I know what happened for Jack Aaron Hirschman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, our next poet is uh, Jennifer Patisti, uh, who's a poet and lifelong Nevadan, who not only was raised uh, within the service industry of Las Vegas, which really truly is the backbone of the city, but she has worked on uh, the strip for 25 years. Um, so Jennifer, are you ready? I'm ready. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for including me in this important conference. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and like Andrew said, I've worked in the hospitality industry for 20 years. And in my writing, I seek to bring visibility to the working class. Um, so today I'll be reading a short excerpt from an essay I wrote about the experience of working in a resort spa on the Strip uh, during the pandemic. In Las Vegas resorts and casinos, the illusion of timelessness, of endless indulgence, must move in a seamless, liquid way that hides the real, the blemished. The hospitality machine can never appear too complicated. It mucks up the fantasy that we workers are always available. But we exist only when you're hungry or thirsty, lonely or bored. A guest asked me, where do the cocktail waitresses come from? They seem to just materialize from patterns in the wallpaper or up from the manic carpet like beaming parade floats, never a run in their pantyhose or a pulse in their outstretched arm. Hospitality holograms, I joked with the guest, and yet it's not too far a stretch. We are in charge of the levers and pulleys, the trap doors and subterranean tunnels, where beneath the action, a whole underground community marches along a less ritzy runway lined with scavenged carpet from imploded casinos and scuffed up banquet chairs saved from the abyss of liquidation. Initially, I was angry at having to weigh a paycheck against my health and my family's health, angry at having to carry this glittering ball we call commerce over the threshold of human decency. And yet, while presenting a tourist with their mask coaster, I was often told I was the first stranger to touch them since the world shut down. This cut right through my PPE and into my heart. They'd remove their face covering and place it onto the disposable luxury paper towel, where it waited for 50 minutes like a blue, breathable nightmare, finally ignored. The intelligence and service positions is anticipatory empathic dexterity. There is wisdom in hands-on work. Jobs deemed manual labor are not less meaningful as a vocation, especially in Las Vegas where attunement to others' needs is the backbone of the city. The real Vegas is beneath paradise. It's the squeaky wheel of the bellman's cart, the cleaning crew's part in the mess sign. It is the casino cage mothers shrinking in their sameness, Graveyard chip runners, hostesses with mega buck grins and hot sauce holsters. They all wave to their children who slip by silently year after year like monorails every hour on the hour. The real Vegas is the toddler in the 24 hour daycare two blocks west of the strip. It's the hallway of size underneath the casino where workers come and go, where they rebuild and disassemble their identities each shift their wordless grief exhaled in transit among the hospitality haunts of decades past, still lingering as omen in overhead fluorescence. It's the employee escalator up the casino floor that eats dreams and spits out rotator cuff surgeries. 
You don't hear about stories about hospitality holograms, stories about how design decisions, abusive scheduling, and service expectations affect the health and, of employees and their families. This is because calculated distance from the guest is as paramount as attention to detail. Invisibility is part of the required uniform. It's stuffed inside the numbered garment bag, sailing the mile long conveyor in the back of the house. Bringing visibility to the humans who make up roughly 60% of the Vegas workforce would dampen the ethical amnesia. It would challenge the idea that Vegas is an honest city, the cure for the common life. It would illuminate what is sacrificed to keep the, vor the vortex pulsing. Storytelling has the power to create visible tension. It has the power to expose the underbelly of tourism and with it the socioeconomic inequality. Each time there is a genuine interaction between guest and employee, thanks to the shared trauma of a global pandemic, I feel hopeful for the visibility of the hospitality industry. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Her uh, next performer is uh, Tony Asante Lightfoot, a native of Washington, D.C. There she fell in love with poetry, artists, science, and scientists. She has developed a curricula that teaches creative writing through the lens of science and science through the lens of creative writing. Tony, are you ready for us? I don't believe Tony is in the house at this point. So I think we should go on to the next person and we'll come back to her when she comes in. Well, let us uh, uh, welcome back our um, previous presenter, R Ruben Guevara. Are you ready, Ruben? Yeah, I am. Am I, uh, am I doing an echo thing here? Can you hear me okay? Uh, you good, brother. You good, you good. Okay. Okay, this, uh, this poem is dedicated to oppression. My name is fuck you if you don't like it. I breathe through fire and stone. I breathe through ashes, flesh, blood and steel. I breathe through centuries of invasions, genocide, colonization, slavery, manifest destiny, incarceration and perpetual occupation. My name is fuck you if you don't like it. I breathe through tears of terror and pain. The Noistitlan, the burning of Mexico City in 1521. Texcoco in 1535. The Holocaust of the Caribbean. Over 30 million indigenous souls took flight between 1500 and 1530. Mani, Yucatan the burning of the Mayan libraries and where Spanish soldiers were ordered to hang village women because their beauty distracted them. Little Bighorn, Wounded Knee, Trail of Tears. In 1942, during World War II, over 120,000 innocent Japanese Americans were put in US concentration camps. The 1943 LA Zoot Suit Riots by US servicemen. The US atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Bloody Sunday March in Selma. The 1965 Watts Rebellion. Vietnam, My Lai Village massacred by US troops. The 1968 massacre of protesting students in Tlatelolco, Mexico City. The 1970 Chicano moratorium riot started by LA sheriffs at Laguna Park, East LA. Nicaragua, Guatemala, the invasion of Panama, the invasion of the Persian Gulf, the invasion of Granada, the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan, the 1992 LA rebellion that led to Ferguson and Baltimore. My name is, fuck you if you don't like it. And I will not be conformed, reformed, deformed. I will not be removed, rebuilt or rebirthed by force, guilt, shame or despair. My name is, fuck you if you don't like it. 
And I am not a multicultural performance artist. I am black, brown, yellow, and red brothers and sisters. I'm a witness. I'm a testament. I am memory. I am a sacred vow. I am a weapon. Your conscience. And fuck you if you don't like it. Oh, that was the best fuck you poem I think I've ever heard. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, Adam put in the chat um, to remind uh, the poets and writers to definitely put in any websites or or uh, social media information you want to share with us. Um, so it looks like Kim Shuck is not here at the moment. So our uh, next performer would be uh, David Romero. David is a Mexican-American spoken word artist from Diamond Bar, California. Romero offers a scholarship for high school seniors interested in spoken word and social justice called the Romero Scholarship for Excellence in Spoken Word. David, are you ready for us? Brother, I don't think David's here. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, let's just keep rolling. We got a lot to talk about. Violetta is here, though. Okay. Yes, so our, our next reader would be Violeta Orozco. She's a gold medal, medal winner of the Latino Book Award for a collection, The Broken Woman Diaries. Her second book, Stillness in the Land of Speed, is forthcoming from Jakar Press. Violeta, are you ready? Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Great to hear everyone's work. Okay, I'm going to read some new stuff. Um, I'm from Mexico City, so the the border between I lived at border between Mexico City and the state of Mexico, which is a socioeconomic border, and the commute is pretty long usually. Um, although it is at the same time, the part where I lived at was suburban, so it's it's very interesting because there's this mix of different communities, working class communities, um, middle class suburban communities. And it's also a very violent site. It's um, where most of femicides, like women murders are, um, take place. And there's like 10 women per day killed in Mexico City. So this is important context to show that being a commuter in Mexico City is harder than being a commuter in other places. So this one's about, it's called, uh, it doesn't have a title yet, but it's dedicated to all the commuters out there. I was a commuter once, let me tell you. I lived far away from downtown and to this day, I don't feel good if I don't cross the bad neighborhoods at least once a month. <laughs> You see, the place where I grew up was far away from everything. I used to ask my dad, how come, daddy, how come? We can't live closer, pero por qué? I got used to be the one who did the big long trek just to meet a dude in a coffee shop he liked near his house. His mother loving me more than the actual son because she recognized how much I did for him. But if she knew how much I bent over backwards, why did she not team up with me instead of coming up with fancy dinners for the three of us? Why didn't she give me a ride in a country where 10 women are killed every day? How the fuck was she so sure I would get home safe? Don't get me wrong. I'm not blaming the mom who probably got dumped by a dude like her son because she was as accommodating as I was. I'm blaming the son for not giving a fuck as long as he got his good old fuck to fuck him. Namely, why even bother? Don't get me wrong. The neighborhood I grew up in wasn't that bad. A boring suburb in the industrial wasteland of a monster city. But I was the but I was one of those who needed more trees, always more trees. I used to have this where I would where meet the people I'd break up with next week. That was my thing. 
one day, one day, this guy said he'd come all the way to my house to apologize. And he was drunk. I thought he was sober. So I said, don't bother, just meet me halfway. There's this indoor mall where we can meet and talk things over. And I was so naive, I waited for two hours before he finally called, said he was still far away, a block away from his house, eating pozole for the hangover. And my last piece is called In Praise of Lies. I want to write this poem in defense of lies for those of us who didn't have the privilege to trust truth because truth would never protect us. And if it were for truth, we would be caved for lies were the only freedom we could afford. I'm telling you, lies were the only freedom we could afford because it's true. You gotta believe me this time. I only cried wolf so many times because I was about to get eaten so many times. Beaten so many times for not being a good kid. And thank God I was never a good girl. And if I ever betrayed those who I loved, it was because they didn't accept me the way I was. I had to steal a life I couldn't have otherwise had. And you know what? I'm proud. I'm proud I skimmed off a life from somewhere. You know what? I'm glad. I'm glad I had my share and didn't have to share everything I did and who I did it with. Because if there was one thing I didn't believe was my life to be private property. My body is my business. And whoever thinks otherwise is a liar or a threat to my private interests, which have never been put before the common good because I always put everyone else before myself. You see, I sacrificed my sanity and health way before I found out lies were a way to create the life I would never have if I turned myself in to the cops of morality and sin. Well, you know what? I'm done with that. So what if I want to masturbate all day? If these lies are so restless, they can ask lies of a man they have found through their own wandering through the filthy streets, the sweet swing of these hips when they touch a beat to make them sway long enough to stay awake through the darkest of the nights all night, through the darkest of the nights all night. Don't let them lie to you. The path is never straight. The long road to knowledge is stacked with traps and truth. It's a dangerous business. I don't mess around with that shit. I got some self-respect and it's okay. I dare them to come up and confront me. I only lied because I didn't have the guts to be true to myself. Thank you so much for listening. Muchas gracias. Fire, you just get better and better every time I hear you, Violeta. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our uh, next poet is uh, James Norman, who digs ditches both literally and metaphorically. He also frames houses, tiles bathrooms, glues PVC, assembles greenhouses, and is probably reading to us today from the job site somewhere in Texas. James, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> None of these have titles and I'm just kind of zipped through them. <clears throat> John Lennon told us to imagine. So I imagine a world where the cops walk down Wall Street and grab random clean cut white guys in fleece vests, khakis and dog shit brown loafers and drag them down to holding for any random financial crime. What? You match the description. The cops tell them as they cool them in a cell. 
Do you know who I am, says indignant bro. But the cops aren't listening. They have to hit their quota if they want all that overtime. He's not busy. A young father makes it home from hustling the corner to his kids who are watching the story unfold on the news, wondering about the injustice of it. So they ask, and he says simply, oh, you know them. They're all the same anyway. Just look at that vest. He dresses like a criminal, doesn't he? And he's not wrong about that. Two. Synopsis of today's news. Robot dog with wireless laser gun shoots down drone in publicity stunt for wide-eyed science writer. And he gets to keep the melted drone as a souvenir. Who will get to keep the melted child? Months later, after we've forgotten the thrill of the salesmanship, while we're stuck in traffic somewhere else. And that week's news story is probably just about how Kanye has gotten canceled again for like the 17th time this year, because somehow it's still worth it. Somehow it's still worth a little money on impossible to locate secondary markets. Alas, we are a people hopelessly in love with sequels and souvenirs. Lasers, napalm, vats of boiling tar tipped over balustrades. The spectacle still sells. It's always someone else's child who is melted down to provide the raw materials of progress. So we don't have to pay attention. According to the news, we're only here for the laser show. This third one. I often wonder why flathead screws even exist when I install fancy hardware. They are more difficult to turn, which prevents you from stripping the delicate wood, but it also prevents you from getting the screw in. They are idiot proof, except they make idiots out of those who know what they are doing. Anymore, most of our modern tools are designed to fail us in times of extreme stress. We call in an expert. They bring the regular ass screws. They charge us a bunch of money to strip out the hole. We find out later when the door handle shakes. But when we call them back to fix it, they don't answer. Their purpose was money. They don't believe in a better world. They know that powerful people aren't afraid to just break it themselves. The rest of us are at the mercy of the broken system it was easier to take for granted. And I'm going to sneak in one last really short one. And thank you guys for everything. And be good and safe and take care of each other. The egg of madness cracks, but nothing is born except words fall out like a nucleotide chain with directions to scrambled, poached, hard-boiled, sunny side up, but the nights long with rain are sweeping in and the shell is the only way to defend oneself and yet it's cracking. And all I get to choose is how it gets cooked and plated. Thank you again, be good. Thank you so much. Our uh, last poet for this section is uh, Christina Gutierrez, who's been fighting for socialism since she was 14 and a half years old. She was a member of a guerrilla movement in Colombia, the M19, and was also one of the co-founders of the Communist Labor Party of North America. Christina, are you ready for us? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Good afternoon. This poem is dedicated to my ex compañero and my daughter. Compañero is the name. Sitting there motionlessly, showing the signs of being pregnant too young, the girl came face to face with death. There were no tears. Perhaps she didn't understand that never again will she see her beloved. So say the newspapers, the friends from her neighborhood, even her parents, 
No, no one really knew. Only you, my love, felt my pain and sadness. Only you knew my wailing cries, those wailing cries that can be embarrassed. I carry in me the seed of your life, the future guerrillera, the one to carry the bullets, the hope for both of us, the one you never knew, the one we made together, the one who tears at my soul, the one who reminds me of you. I never got to have a last look at your face. I never got to feel your cold and motionless hand. The soldiers did not realize that at one time you did indeed exist. I look, I look everywhere for you. I wanted to touch your bones with my lips, to caress your tortured, loving face, still with your smile of victory. I believe that if I, if only I came closer to living again, your ashes may, might return. Lying in bed still after so many years, my hand searches to caress your body and my lips seek the tenderness of your kiss. But though you are mine, you are one more of the martyrs of the people. Your memory ignites the flames in my body. Your ashes are sown inside my womb and I know that you have not died. Father of my daughter, Grandfather to the people, you are reborn in every man with the spilling of your blood upon the earth. You will live forever, always in my memory. The semen of your life runs through my veins. The deadly chat against the enemy with it will, car will carry out the chant, I still love you, compañero. I still scream, patria libre o morir, and believe me, it will be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all the presenters and the performers. I'm really uh, proud to have been a part of this. Okay, um, so we'll be moving into um, our second session and um, Gregory Pond will be taking over as moderator. Um, I'll tell you a little about, about Gregory. Gregory Pond was born in Brooklyn, New York to Panamanian parents. He is the author and publisher of four books of poetry, a member of Lerna, Revolutionary Poets Brigade, and Queer Rebels, and facilitates Poetically Speaking, a call-in program for seniors. He is a member of the Cultural Committee. Gregory, are you ready? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And um, welcome, everybody, those, who, those of you who are just joining us. Uh, we're into our second session and this is entitled Global Dimensions. So we're going to move a little bit around the world in this one. And um, we are going to start um, in Europe. 